All right. I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. I imagine there's be some more people um, filtering in as we get started, but nonetheless, it's worth getting moving. So good, e good evening, everyone. Um, and welcome to the second Technoglass Lecture of the Spring Series. I'm Joel Lemire, curator of this series and director of the Graduate Programs in Architecture here at the University of Miami School of Architecture. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Felicia Davis joining us to discuss her work and its context. First though, uh, I need to dwell a moment on the Technoglass part of the Technoglass lecture um, series. Without their enduring support, we would not be in the position to invite and learn from such a great cast of architects, designers, researchers from all over the world. So our ambition is basically matched by their generosity. And for that, I think Technoglass very deeply. So two weeks ago, I admitted that one of my curatorial efforts for this spring series was simply to invite some of my favorites. Um, and this week's speaker certainly fits that description. So Virginia Sanfratello, Brandon Clifford, Sean Canty, Philippe Block are going to round out this group and this series. But more topically, more to the point, Felicia Davis's academic project exemplifies the complex terrain navigated by, let's say, materially oriented thinkers, which I alluded to when I crafted the theme for the semester. So let me read a, a little bit of that theme. Operating in material conditions and architectural imagine, imaginaries. The speakers here are committed to design's agency in addressing these seemingly intractable and entangled issues of our moment and diverse in representing a broad set of voices and agendas. I've curated this specific set because they posit an essential shared premise namely that to accomplish the revolutionary changes required of a responsible architecture, we must reinvent the matter that constitutes it. Such materially focused practices, often bankrolled by industry and institutions invested in preserving the economic and social status quo, are caught between the global need for radical change and the material realities of funding their research. Many operate in a kind of tactical middle ground, producing research that delivers both incremental progress while being aimed explicitly or not at radical possibilities. So now I don't uh, know if our speaker tonight, Felicia Davis would self-describe in exactly those terms. So per perhaps I'm, I'm projecting a bit, but I think at least one portion of this characterization is pretty undeniable, right? Which is that the radical possibilities implicit in her work. So through her research and computational textiles, particularly she replaces the hard with the soft, um, the standardized with the tailored, and in turn reorients design, let's say, away from the so-called universal and towards the specific. This reorientation has a strongly political dimension too, right? Um, that the universal is never actually, actually universal. Instead, it really is a stand-in for a homogenized public that erases unconventional bodies and underrepresented constituencies generally. So as such, her project is simultaneously about the body and about the body politics. So this dual concern sets Felicia apart from many who practice a less critical version of computation. And for the sharpness of this agenda, she is widely recognized and exhibited. And I, in fact, was, was lucky enough to see her work in person at the Keller Gallery at MIT, where she was finishing her PhD in design computation. Since then, she's been exhibited at MoMA, featured on the PBS series Women in Science Profiles. She co-founded the Black Reconstruction Collective um, and established her own award-winning design practice, Felicia Davis Studio among other achievements. She is additionally uh, an associate professor at the Stuckerman Center for Design Computing at Penn State, where she directs the research center Soft Lab at PSU. We are very lucky to have her today, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her speak, um, despite the fact that she couldn't make it in person. Uh, and so on behalf of the School of Architecture um, at the University of Miami, and on behalf of Technoglass, please join me in welcoming Felicia Davis. Thank you, Joel, for that wonderful uh, introduction, and also uh, Dean uh, El Khoury for the invitation to come here. I am very sad not to be with you in person, and we'll look forward to that in the future. So I think that, um, let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> let me know if you can see that because I can't see uh, the grid anymore, people. Yeah, it looks good, Felicia, we can see it. Is it working? Okay, great. So I wanted to talk today about uh, what I call scenes. And I, I think that 
the path that one walks as a black architect or designer has many seams or gaps within which one improvises and stitches together things to make a story or really understand where one is coming from and where one is and how to make sense of things that do not under any circumstances make any sense and never did. And there are many gaps and lacunae that are bridged by these scenes. And I would say that along these places, one finds creativity and ways of making that integrate fragments from the past, but in fact project the future. This evening, I would like to share with you three projects, a preamble project, a quilt, and an antenna that reveal some of the seams in my work that are areas of investigation. And as uh, Joel just stated, um, in my lab, soft lab at PSU in the Stuckman Center for Design Computing, we work on computational textiles, which are textiles that respond to the environment via programming, embedded sensors, and electronics, in addition to using the responses from the natural properties of fibers, where the response is used by the designer to communicate some type of information to people. So communication for our purposes means the sending of an intentional message or information through aesthetic expression. And my work is to really relook at the role of textiles in building, not just as a way to achieve lightweight buildings, which is important, but to really understand how we can use the fibers of the textile itself to communicate and how that impacts architecture. So tonight I'd like to show some of the entanglements, so to speak, of working with textiles, computation, and soft materials. And I find that the material itself that we're dealing with, and I think this is true of everything that we work with, but I think that the material itself shapes a way of thinking and working that leads to considering architecture and its practices in a different way. And I would say that my lab has been working towards an understanding of a soft system, which thus far to us is a system that accounts for and accommodates a technological system that can register design in relation to specific bodies in specific places engaging in specific social, cultural, and political constructions. Let's see if I can change the slide here. So the first project that I'd like to share with you is really a preamble project. It's a design for the African burial ground in lower Manhattan. This is a thesis project that I did way back when as a, as a master's student and it really propelled me to look more closely at the relationship between architecture and textiles. It's done long ago, but really I am showing it because it still resonates through the work that I do um, that is happening today. Um, Leslie Loco has covered this project uh, in her book, White Paper, Black Marks, where you can read more about it. But during the time when I was working on my thesis, the burial ground was unearthed in Manhattan while digging the foundations for a 34 story uh, federal office tower at the corner of Duane Street and Lower Broadway in Manhattan. And while they were digging, they brought up skeletons, bits of coffins and other art artifacts from the old and forgotten slave burial ground outside the Dutch walls that occupied the space and that's now known as Wall Street. And so construction was halted at the time and a full kind of archeological dig was authorized. And the project uh, that I worked on um, really recovered sacred grounds and revealed new information about the people who were buried uh, there through archeological cataloging. So really set up this kind of dialogic between um, looking at something scientifically and looking at something through ritual meaning and how um, people, I guess you could say, em embedded that into the way that they thought about culture. So a source of in inspiration at the time was from African funerals. In this case, you're looking at a photograph from a magazine 
um, that was an article on Kalabari funerals, celebration and display from African arts. And this is back in 1988 at the time. And it was important to me uh, to kind of track how I was thinking about uh, African culture, thinking about African-American culture, thinking about black culture, right? And li literally specifically even thinking about those words and the transition um, in terms of how we use them and, and, and how they've changed uh, today. So it's important to note that at the time I'd never been to Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so this was my access, my, one of my first access to being in Africa. And what you're looking at is a funer funeral room where uh, cloths were laid out in honor of the dead person and the more cloths that were put up the kind of more honorific and the cloths were also folded at the time. Um, so a wealthy family would have accumulated many, many different fabrics of beautiful colors and textiles. So these elaborately folded ones spoke to a kind of display that would be shown on the bed. And again, I'm getting this from a magazine um, because I hadn't been to Africa, I hadn't been to see um, this kind of space before. And so it was quite a different time in terms of you know looking at things now, we can go on the internet and get download you know, live video for what's going on in Accra uh, in the marketplace right now. So the project here made use of this idea of these folded plus on top of the kind of um, bed is an honorific place and folded a space to make a museum. In other words, the kind of piece that looked at what was buried, you know, looked at what was buried there versus the kind of sacred ground on the other side where we're kind of covering it back over with cloth. So you're looking at a site model here, which shows that extent of the burial ground in that folded building. And the details of the glass that would be used for that folded building, as well as that surface on the ground, were generated from the strong directionality of bodies laid in the ground, overlapped with African patterning. And what started out from, you know, as colorful cloth in the magazine article that I just showed you was reconstructed in white, representing a scientific cataloging and translation into a kind of Christian tradition. So all the other projects that I'm going to show you, the two that I'm going to show you tonight, are inspired from this beginning project. So um, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I've been kind of really taking different threads from this core uh, experience with this thesis and kind of unwinding them and following them to uh, different places that come from here. So I believe the takeaway from this project and the research was to understand, at least for me, your position in the world, who I was, um, you know, what was this place in relationship to me? What are appropriate methods to understand uh, what was going on here? And that it was very important, you know, another takeaway that was very important to say I and not erase oneself. Um, and the I wasn't necessarily this kind of huge egoistic I was really saying, I'm going to be very specific about what I'm looking at here and put myself very humbly in relationship to all this other knowledge and where it's coming from and try to, you know, understand uh, what's happened. So this is something that I have looped back on many times in my scientific writing. We'll, I'll take you through some works that we've been doing there, but it has been made clear to me many times when writing, especially for design computing, that one should not use the pronoun I. However, the abstraction without I, that if you take yourself out of the paper when you're writing a scientific paper, it becomes highly problematic. And I've been thinking about uh, Bell Hooks's use of the lower case for her name and also um, restoring this concept of I to scientific writing. Now, this is probably heresy, but 
Um, anyway, I think it's important because you know there are, there are things happening uh, with the way we're thinking about architecture today that uh, needs to have a specific body. You need to be pay attention to what your experiment, who your experiment works for, and where it's coming from. So we'll get back to that in a second. So what happened when I dealt with the positionality in the work was that this work needed different kinds of ways of asking questions. So this revised framing uh, was part of how the commission from MoMA arrived for the reconstructions, Blackness in America, Blackness in Architecture in America in July, 2019. And the show was supposed to open in October of 2020, but we ended up being pushed back quite a few months into uh, February, 2021 because of the pandemic. There were two curators, two primary cur curators and an assistant, Sean Anderson, um, who's an associate curator at MoMA and Mabel Wilson, professor of architecture and professor in Africana studies at Columbia, as well as Ariel Dion Prosmet, Krasnick, who was their assistant, who was later um, replaced by Anna Burkhart. And I mentioned these people because uh, their contributions really changed uh, what happened at the museum. While I was very honored um, seeing these three curators, not only for who they were, um, but the thing that kind of really got me in terms of uh, wanting to participate in this was that they had agreed to collaborate on the curation. And that made me trust this institution more because, uh, you know, MoMA wasn't really known for uh, seeking out the work of Black architects and, and Black artists. So I was like, okay, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But um, with this, these three, there was a, immediately a kind of ground of trust. So in addition, uh, these three assembled an amazing advisory board of Black artists, architects, curators, urban designers, who attended a second meeting um, where there was a critique about the work that was planned for the exhibit as well as a conversation. And artists you know, were issued an incredible reading collection and discussed these readings in a first uh, kind of meeting with the group practicing Refusal Collective, who you see in front of you here in this picture, who are Mabel Wilson, Sadia Hartman, and Tina Kempt. And at this first meeting, uh, you know, we presented and discussed potential trajectories of our work and kind of preambles, again, of what we were thinking about for the exhibit. And they talked about refusing to participate in systems of oppression which made each of us in turn, each of us artists, question if we should hold such an exhibition in an institution that was really about showing its power and shaping a space about art and architecture that was not inclusive or interested in works by people of color. So they really kind of raised this question. We're like, well, what are we, what are we doing here? <laughs> so we had a lot of discussion around this outside of the museum and um, decided that in spite of the known challenges that we as a group of artists thought it was important to go ahead with the exhibition. Um, MoMA after all had allowed the curatorial team to formulate what we felt was a well-framed forward-thinking exhibition. Um, they had made the space to question in the first place. Um, so we appreciated that freedom as well as a call and response that opened with this multi-voiced curation. So those were things that we were very excited about and thought um, that could, you know, we could use to bear to change what was happening in this institution. So as an act of refusal, we as a group of artists and architects and designers formed the Black Reconstruction Collective at our second meeting in November. And the overarching purpose of our organization is to finish the project of black emancipation that was started in the reconstruction era of the United States, by, but eroded by successive structures put in place by white supremacy. We're a not-for-profit organization here to provide intellectual and monetary support for artists, scholars, designers, 
who are creating new knowledge about design for the African diaspora. And our programs will be coming shortly. And I hope there are those of you out in the audience who are doing uh, work on the African diaspora and creating new knowledge and will come and uh, join us and seek support through grants, et cetera. So the point of the BRC was to take the work outside of the museum so that the work went beyond us individuals and took the exhibit into a broader realm. A second point was to produce a space where artists and designers and others could try things and look at things that might, might, might not be looked at because of cautiousness or outright blindness. So the photo that you're looking at is a bridge into the exhibition that shows uh, what we call the BRC, which is the Black Reconstruction um, Manifesting Textile that holds our mission statement. And uh, it covers the name of the Philip Johnson Gallery uh, in MoMA. So underneath this cloth is, you know, it says Philip Johnson Gallery. And that was something that also <laughs> We talked about a lot because we thought we needed to, uh, you know, Philip Johnson was a Nazi sympathizer and tried to initiate a fascist group in the United States. And it was pretty much contrary to what we were trying to do with our show. So this was our way uh, to prepare uh, the gallery and prepare the ground for uh, what we wanted to exhibit there. And so on January 6th, we held a meeting with the head curatorial team at MoMA. And as we were meeting, we were getting all these texts about the Capitol was being stormed. And, and so all these things were coming together, um, literally as we were sitting there talking with the head curatorial team, uh, Glenn Laurie, and, and trying to change this institution. It was really something at the time. Uh, and so lots of things were kind of happening then. So these are uh, the 11 artists I, uh, that participated in the exhibition and each artist was asked to select a city uh, from a list that was agreed upon by uh, the, th the curators. So upon reflection, um, refusal happened in a variety of ways in the works presented. Uh, if I were to analyze what was on exhibit, I would say I saw a refusal to present anything that fixed or otherwise tried to repair historical acts manifested in the 11 cities. And by this, I mean, uh, you know, the kind of regular toolkit of wiping out black communities in the United States. Um, these tools included use of highways uh, to cut black communities and communities of color off from larger settlements, to use eminent domain, for example, to declare uh, black communities and neighborhoods in poor repair and thus seize the land for other purposes. Also redlining, right? So there's a whole series of things that if one looks back in even recent history uh, that cut off and uh, really hurt black communities. So rather what I saw was a reimagining of what could be an, a, an imagining of what was good about blackness. And what I saw was a potential for making dreams. And so this space of refusal was really uh, a way of designing uh, you seeing design as dreaming, right? How can we see ourselves, not as we are now, but what we want to be? What will we actually want to be? So um, I selected Pittsburgh as my city because I had recently moved to Pennsylvania and wanted to know more about it. And I'd done some work in Pittsburgh before but had not really looked into the dynamics of the black neighborhoods there. And I chose the Hill District to begin to understand what was going on there. What was the story there? I did a lot of research, uh, some of which you can see in the video. I'm gonna show you the video in a second, uh, which was made in response to the Black Reconstruction Collective's question, 
what is black reparation? So it's one of a triptych of videos about stories in Pittsburgh. And in terms of the work commissioned for MoMA, there are two parts to the work, uh, transmissions and receptions. The transmissions part is a quilt that connects to the Hill District in Pittsburgh, which is a historically black neighborhood. And it tells stories about the district and it's meant to travel outside of the museum. And the second part is the receptions part, uh, which is a fabric antenna that stays inside the museum. So I'm gonna play you a video of some of the preliminary research work.
So the quilt was a way to start making sense of all the research that we were finding on Pittsburgh in the Hill District. And it was not intended to be the architecture of the project, but become a method of questioning. But since we've made this, I've actually questioned whether or not, in fact, uh, that construction of the quilt is not itself architecture. And I'll, I'll explain myself in a second. Uh, the quilt was made as a computational textile and points to those experiences and skills with sewing, working with soft materials and brings them into architecture. It's a method and operates as real material, as metaphor or heuristic device for thinking about operations and concepts in making architecture. So for us in the studio, the gaps in between the images, the orders of images, the gaps in between the panels allowed us to understand a bit more about what was going on in the photos and what this meant to us. So sewing the panels down to close our circuits was a signal of another phase in the quilt. Um, we're intrigued with how the ordering can remake new stories. And one of my graduate students played with this problem of scrambling the parts in another project, um, which I'll show you in a minute. So the quilt was meant to really start a conversation with people about making and is a repository of history. When touched, the copper in each panel activates a speaker that tells a story about what happened in the panel. And uh, we'd like to take this quilt on the road to the Hill District and continue to hear and make new stories with residents on the Hill. Um, we want people to bring their own photographs um, and tell the stories about those photographs. And the quilt was really meant to be our connecting and networking material. So this was interrupted by COVID, but um, things being what they are, we are making this part of another project that the BRC is working on called Unmonuments and really trying to construct a kind of way of people um, being able to talk about their neighborhood and engage uh, what gets planned there. So the softness in this material system is how we define the concept of construction of communication, which is collaborative and incrementally built. The lily pad uh, designed by Leah Beakley a designer, a computer scientist at the University of New Mexico permits the fashioning of do-it-yourself work. And the lily pad is that little round thing in the bottom part of the quilt. This is supported by a network of online tutorials and programs. And this network is also part of what we understand to be the material. So for many of the works that we do, the ability to access and use these inexpensive do-it-yourself components is the difference between connecting or not. In deciding what piece went where, a second layer of circuits is closed um, and closes the story on the back of the quilt. An idea that we've been thinking about is how to open up the story so you don't have to stitch them down, but put, you know, make a way that allows us to put the pieces in different order. So we're, we're going back to looking at quilt making and craft. But an example of this can be seen in this project uh, that my PhD graduate student Farzana Akazian has developed uh, for her coursework uh, in my course on fiber composites. And Farzana calls this the circuit game. And it looks to teach young kids how to close a circuit using pieces that are connected with copper, ripstop nylon and stainless steel coated fabrics. And the idea is to close a cir circuit and light up an LED uh, by tying groups of these together. And you can find this work uh, published in the proceeds for distributed ambient and pervasive computing 2020. These are some of the combinations uh, of the pieces which are made um, from felt, carbon fiber, knitted pieces, what we had uh, laying around in our uh, soft lab and scraps of things. So she tried out various connectors and ways to allow the pieces to plug and play. So I think this technique could work 
for us in the quilt to allow it to be open, to allow us to tell stories in different ways. Um, and we'll take this on the road in the next year um, in the Unmonuments project. So in my lab, um, a computational textile as a material changes the idea of material to one that's expansive. The material may be understood like the above image where a designer is weaving together a person or body, a body monitor such as a heart monitor, a mobile phone, a laptop, a set of responsive yarns, a power system, and that kind of ambiguous the environment. So this drawing shows just one example of a textile material system. The quilts would be another diagram altogether, uh, dispersed and distributed, but um, adding in for variable people and stories, there's a different material diagram emergent. There may be some textile material systems that include other parts, such as people who might be looking at what's happening to the heart monitor or a manufacturer who might be connected with a wearer. Uh, to our eyes, materials incorporates bodies and are expansive. If materials change us as we change them, I would say that we have a lot to think about in terms of how these, these kind of things, these materials are changing our way of thinking. So here's a detail uh, from the quilt showing a scene that speaks to how I set up my lab at Penn State. The lab at Penn State is a way of foregrounding the making experiences that many of us had as kids and still have working with soft materials. And I wanted to make sure that when I set up my lab in the Stuckman Center for Design Computing, much like Leah Beakley's lab, that amongst the laser cutters and the CNC milling machines, that there would be sewing machines and knitting machines and knitting needles and, and electronic bits that people could play with. Because these materials call for another way of fabrication and thinking about architecture that connects both to the scale of the body because we often start by making things like clothing and then move up to very large scales of architecture. So working this way also returns you to the specifics of your body, not some abstract body where you're building for, but a particular body. And for this reason, um, really, we've got two research directions in our lab. The first direction is more architecturally traditional, um, where we look at using textiles for sheltering. These are projects like tents, shade structures, etc. And a second direction is looking at the human body in space and trying to understand potentials for rethinking what architecture could be by understanding the augmented and sensing body in its environment. And these projects are material that you wear on your body or use the body as part of the system. A scene like you see in this quilt panel um, was a very familiar scene to me growing up. And I felt that many of the things that I've been thinking about came from this well of knowledge about soft materials. And in addition, um, you know, we're looking at uh, how one incorporates these materials or has access to materials that can communicate other information through your clothing. And so in this case, you see the young woman with a skirt that is in copper. That interest uh, was seeded uh, for me, and everybody has a different story, but was seeded at our dining table, uh, typically in the summers with my mother, my sister, my aunt Ruth, and uh, of course my brothers would my brother would run through with his friends and check out what's going on. Uh, my aunt Ruth took a lot of fashion courses in the evenings. She was a ER nurse and saw some really rough things in uh, Chicago, um, city of Chicago. And so fashion for her was this kind of creative outlet and uh, she was amazing at it. And we always had the most beautifully crafted fashionable clothing as children because of my Aunt Ruth. And although we never wanted for anything um, in my family, we made our own clothes. That's just how we rolled. And we were interested in making things that expressed our 
ourselves and express our identity that we didn't see in the stores necessarily. So that clothing and the making of elegance by how you carried yourself and what you wore was a way to transport you to someplace else, to fight back, to take on other identities and to understand the world in a different way. And most importantly, to dream. So the image here shows 1100 Wiley Avenue in the Hill District, Pittsburgh, and is undergirded by Teeny Harris's photograph. Uh, Teeny Harris is a black photographer uh, who took photographs of everyday black life in the Hill District and other neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. This image shows, I think this is in uh, 1959, uh, calls out the highway and tells the story of I-579 that crosses at the bottom of the Hill District. Uh, that was the beginning of forming the National Highway infrastructure. And so for Pittsburghers, the problem today, the kind of repercussions of this unfold as the question, how should we reconnect our downtown, which is in the upper half of the picture, or the, how should we reconnect the upper part of town, which is in the upper half of the picture, with what's below uh, the two banded highway, which is uh, basically the cultural district of Pittsburgh and the kind of golden triangle where all the businesses are. There's a steep drop off underneath that highway as well. And so right now Pittsburgh is spending some time thinking about how to reconnect these parts. And I, I think it's happening in cities uh, throughout the United States. How, to, how do you reconnect these pieces that were at one time cut off? At the time, um, the round dome that was put up was seen as a welcoming and gathering form to collect people into the center of Pittsburgh. And you can see it going up here, but uh, quickly became a kind of another symbol. So you saw, you saw women golfing in front of it at the start of it, uh, really kind of hoping and dreaming for another life, you know, jobs were promised, et cetera, but uh, like in the video that didn't happen. And so you ended up with these kind of seams or places where people were separated and, you know, people were bitter, people were upset, people knew that they had to uh, get out in the streets and say something about this. This particular slide that you're looking at shows uh, Freedom Corner before it uh, got its beautiful new kind of brick paving and um, sculpture. It's across from, uh, I, I forgot the name of the church, but in the far left corner, there's a church that is still there. And where the sign sits, uh, it is dedicated as Freedom Corner and, and um, has some poetry there as well. So really, uh, the quilt was about kind of setting up a network and really allowing a place for people to connect and to, and to tell their stories through um, this kind of invisible media, digital form. The reception part of the project is what I call the flower antenna or the black flower antenna. And it's located, it was located in the museum. And the black flower antenna speaks to those invisible networks formed by electromagnetic waves that we all graf grapple with in terms of liberation. And it was a symbol, symbolic responsive structure, a receiving antenna um, that was made up of 34 industrially knitted cones embedded with pink copper yarns to transmit the presence of electromagnetic waves via high pitched live sounds in the gallery. And the black flower serves to make visible and present the workings of an invisible urbanism that floats above the physical city supported and constructed by electromagnetic waves. These invisible waves are a new global ocean, making it possible for people to connect to the internet However, traversing this ocean uh, is as perilous to us as the Atlantic of the Middle Passage. 
and the black flower is a reminder of this other invisible space that is also being constructed and needs attention and for a more life valuing future. So many things that we do today are really, um, we take for granted and uh, kind of open, have been framed as open territories that people are grabbing. So I wanted to talk about that. And the pink underbelly of the antenna shows embedded copper and poly yarn, which is uh, what permits the collection of the invisible electromagnetic waves in the gallery. And the form of the flower was selected to give us an opportunity to study a gradient of parametrically sized cones. Uh, these were drawn in kangaroo and kiwi 3D and simulated to see if we could predict the sizes and shapes of the cones. And this was important to help getting the fiberglass compression rods the right length and diameters ahead of time, because we had to pre-construct a lot of things. We also tested a couple different methods of machine learning and have looked at many Thompson Ramsgaard's uh, CETA's method on this using scanning as well as a couple of others. And we've published this in a research, a simulation process for architectural knitted textiles at IASS and also have been working actually this semester uh, with more machine learning uh, processes uh, to predict sizes and shapes of knitted material, which is really tough uh, material to kind of get a grip with because it's looped. Uh, it doesn't behave like a woven structure. And that is something that is very scary <laughs> if you're an architect and you have to deliver something of a certain size at a certain time. So you, you need to be able to tell ahead of time, which is the design part, what you are doing uh, to somebody else, to communicate that to somebody else. So I think I have, here we go. Yeah, this particular slide uh, shows the many steps and iterations of this project in the making of the cones. Um, just to go over a few in the upper left, uh, Drawing shows um, basically what we gave to our industrial knitter uh, to, to tell them the sizes. And they put that into the machine, which is the upper right hand image. And then the lower image was our compression system. You can see the kind of aluminum hoops and then the fiberglass rods that are laying next to it. But really the, the kind of largest challenge was in fact, um, you know, how, how large do we tell the knitter to make our particular pattern given our yarn side, you know, our yarn and our stitch structure uh, because things were stretching, you know, 10% larger, 15% larger. So this took us the longest time to settle and really it helped a lot once, once we got our copper yarn embedded in there because metal doesn't stretch a lot. So it kind of uh, helped us get control over that. A second uh, challenge was uh, really translating what we had drawn and using feet and inches to stitches and yarns. And so this is something else that we've been working on in my lab is a tool uh, that can look at specific stitch structures uh, as you're working from a model, like a digital model, uh, to have actual stitches. And um, yeah, a third challenge was getting these compression systems, the kind of rods to be the right length and to fit properly. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, very close to the time when all this was due, everything sort of snapped together. We finally got a right a close enough algorithm in Kiwi 3D, a close enough, uh, you know, cut on our uh, compression system. So things went ahead um, and, and worked out fine. But uh, for a while there, it was pretty hairy. In the last uh, corner on the far right, uh, you see our an antenna board. We had fantastic antenna help from Aaron Lewis a student of Delia Dumitrescu at the Swedish School of Textiles, and she's a PhD candidate there. And she's been exploring the potentials of electromagnetism 
as a phenomenon using textiles in both weaving and knitting. And she uh, really introduced to us the artistic possibility and the potential of this invisible uh, median. So I highly recommend looking at Erin Luce's work, which is available online. If you go to the Swedish School of Textiles, So just to give you a sense of scale, um, some of the hoops were quite large, but uh, during the pandemic, since all of this was made during the pandemic, one of the reasons we made these separate pieces was that people could take parts home and work on them at their kitchen tables or in their living room, because originally we had a, a much larger singular piece and we saw, I saw right away that, that it was going to be dangerous working on it in the pandemic, we had to get special permission to come into our school, uh, into the lab to work. Uh, but, you know, we made these pieces so that people could be spread out um, and separate. So, um, you know, what we were trying to do in our lab really is to develop computational methods, tools, and designs for soft architecture architectures, um, and also to connect with people emotionally, register their presence, and to provoke questions about the order of our society. And we view softness as a powerful quality to think about reconstructing. And so I'm going to show you one last video before closing of the quality of the sound. Uh, all of this was installed remotely uh, by Zoom. So we, the MoMA had an amazing team of people that put this up, but they help, were holding the computer up and GoPro cameras <laughs> while, we, while we were explaining to them what went where. We had diagrams, we gave them videos, but still you gotta be there at a certain point. You gotta kind of work with people to get things installed. But we have a, I have a kind of quality just to show you what the sound is like. So before we go, um, I just want to say something about the sound and uh, the antenna. Uh, when they put the antenna up, uh, we were not there to tune it. And tuning an antenna is critically important because basically what you can do by positioning it is pick up and select different kind of wavelengths in that particular room. So that was one wavelength that they picked up when we put up our antenna. But I would say this is unfinished work and something that um, Aaron and I are going to work on um, this project, which we call Tuning N, and look at the kind of interaction of bodies with this uh, media. So looking forward to dealing with that. The other, the other thing I will say is that uh, the aesthetic rawness uh, was something that I really appreciated. It wasn't meant to turn into music or something that was sonorous, but really kind of surprising. And just to let you know that there's this kind of rawness and wildness <laughs> that surrounds us and is everywhere. So with that, I will close and uh, take questions from the floor. Let's see if I can stop sharing here. Uh, amazing, Felicia. I think it might take, um, I would invite people to maybe throw questions into the chat that, that we can deliver to Felicia. Uh, you know, it may take a second for people to input that. So, um, so maybe I, maybe I can start. <laughs> I mean, I think that there's obviously so much interesting stuff going on here and I, you know, particularly hadn't, uh, hadn't yet seen the, the last project. Right. And so that, that one is 
pretty stunning to me. And the fact that you had to install that over Zoom like makes my skin crawl as someone who's deeply invested in like installation project. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, like. Uh, it, it almost gives me a panic attack just imagining it, <laughs> right? Because so much of that has to be adjustment on the fly and the like, and particularly with, to your point, textiles is just uh, scary, right? Um, in any case, I mean, I think that there's, there's a couple, uh, you know, basic questions that I, that I would have for you. I mean, I think one of the distinctions between, um, well, you, you make the very explicit distinction about, uh, you know, your work being invested in questions of communication, let's say, rather than than innovation, like pure innovation. And I think there's something there that distinguishes you from other people that are working in textiles, whether computational weaving or, 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 or knitting, right? So people like, you know, Jenny Sabin or Sean Alquest, right? Like people who are doing really interesting work, but, but seem to be couching it in a kind of purely technological mode of like new possibility, as opposed to a kind of more storytelling or narrative mode that you're working in. And I wonder, um, you know, which is not to say that you're not doing that other kind of like incremental research or like real research too, but there's, it comes with a very, very different flavor for your, for your work. And that, you know, it's not really a question yet, except to ask what you, um, how you, you know, see yourself positioned in relationship to that other work, um, whether you, you see it as a distinct project or some of two parallel projects, right, that are happening. I see, I see it as two parallel projects that are happening. One is um, a question about what could this mean for people? Uh, what can this mean for culture? Um, how can we live with this? And the other questions that go on with this work are um, scientific really, like how can we predict the size of something with these materials? Can we use machine learning to help us uh, get a grip on the way in which you know we make a piece of architecture? A lot of, a lot of architects shy away from working with textiles because they don't stay in one place, right? It's a kind of form active uh, material and it is really scary. Yeah, like your stuff may not, may not stay in the same place. So this is something that you have to grapple with as an architect, you have to kind of make all these tools and figure out uh, how you can take on the liability as an architect for something that wants to move, that wants to be kind of a little bit have a, have a greater range of kind of motion in it. So I think that um, there are there are two, I think trajectories always in the work, and we we are definitely um, you know taking things apart scientifically and and doing you know the research. We apply for NSF grants as well, and we also apply for national you know the humanities grants in addition so we're kind of spanning both of these areas with what we do in our lab and i would say just about um sean's work um sean's work has taken is is really has taken an interesting turn he's also been looking at um kind of I guess you could say connecting through the body, like how one might also communicate uh, through the textile and what this could mean for people who understand things differently, for example, through, he has an autistic daughter. And, and so he's been looking at ways in which textiles can uh, communicate and connect with people who may have different abilities, right? So, I think, I think that um, I would say within textiles, almost everybody working with knitted textiles, and there are like seven of us <laughs> in the world, really, because we, we get together and we meet, there's like seven, <laughs> and there's some PhD students in the pipeline uh, that, that uh, the focus is changing from the scientific alone to also understanding what can we do with this socially? What does it mean to live with these materials? How might these be environmentally responsible? What can we do uh, to kind of make things better for people? So I think there has been a, a change from really pushing primarily the technological to the technology in service of right how people live, what it means, et cetera. 
Yeah, it's a great point. I had forgotten about that Sean's project with the the, um, yeah, the autism question, and I, I remember that project very distinctly now. I'm thinking it was a kind of term for him that's really really interesting. And I think there, yeah, yeah the parallel there is is great with yours because you started at the outset talking about like specificity and particular bodies and how. Um, at least in my setup, I was talking about the difference between that and the kind of generalizable, and that is exactly sort of the same same question that is posed in the question of like you know addressing things for autistic people who are differently able or learn differently versus like the conventional like you know um, homogeneous like public or subject that we might address otherwise. And so I feel like there are really strong parallels there, um, and I think that mm -hmm. you know all of us who are invested in some sort of technological research are maybe hopefully coming around to a less sort of purely techno-optimistic realm and, and a more sort of critical perspective, right, on it. Um, and so maybe that's in the air. And so I'm glad to hear you articulate that. Um, you know, I think someone had one one quick question of clarification about the antenna projects. Um, mm -hmm. Just asking again, what, it, what exactly it was picking up and, you know, uh, what else it connected to. I mean, I think you spoke about it, but maybe you can just uh, revisit what that was, was trying to do. Yeah, the antenna was trying to pick up any electromagnetic waves in the gallery. And it picked up one, which we think is Wi-Fi um, making that noise. I think the megahertz that we were in between five and 50 in terms of the range, um, like the sound waves that we could pick up. And it was not trying to connect to anything else. It was really a receiving antenna. And there, are, I mean, when we were doing this research, I learned so much about antennas, but uh, it, was not meant to um, transmit anything. It's simply to gather in what is there and to collect energy from the waves that are in that particular space. So for example, you could take this like antenna and put it um, in a forest, right? And there are, in the shade of the forest, you can collect energy through electromagnetic waves that are moving through that forest, right? So this is something that Aaron talks about. It's another way of thinking about uh, collecting energy that's out there. It's not solar energy, but it operates in a similar way. We can collect those waves that are floating out there a little bit. It's just, they're available, right? So, <laughs> and it's there, we just can't see it. So the antenna was a receiving antenna. I hope I answered this person's question, Stagmar's uh, question. Yeah, I think that that's, that's pretty clear. Um, again, it's yeah. another instance in which you you also openly described your work as working on like sort of several levels, one of which is metaphorical, right? And I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's a really difficult um, terrain, especially like here speaking as somebody involved in pedagogical questions, right? Like, like we wanna press students away from the metaphorical most of the time because it ends up being sort of oversimplistic or reductive even, let's say, about the work that it's up to. And yours mm -hmm. manages not to be that. Maybe I'd, I'd like to just hear you as a teacher now, speaking teacher to teacher, how you talk to your <laughs> students about the, the metaphor, right? Because it's a, it's a very sti sticky and problematic um, topic, I think, in architectural discourse. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I'll come at that through computation because I think the most recent uh, discussion about metaphor comes through computation, we were talking about how there are metaphors that we have in language that uh, basically frame things in a certain way. And they can be, these metaphors, these kind of pre-understood things can be dangerous because they lead you to kind of encapsulate your thinking really quickly. <laughs> and so um, one of the things to think about with metaphors is like kind of almost taking its, I don't know how to put it, but to kind of really break it down. Where is it coming from? What is it limiting you to? And to be very, um, to be very sort of careful about how you use the metaphor. And I would say um, in design computing, I think the metaphor, at least one of the ways that I've been thinking about it is through language because of communication. And language is the thing that allows us to connect to somebody else. And it is like 
if you can get a good metaphor, it will springboard you like to someplace else uh, without flattening things. But this is very difficult to do. So I don't know if I have answered your question pedagogically, but yeah, there, there are pros and cons to using metaphor. They can be really flattening and not so interesting, but they can also be really powerful if you're also thinking about new metaphors, right? Um, if you're coming from a place where, oh, that's a weird and bizarre metaphor. What do you mean by that? <laughs> like, it could be very powerful as well. So I don't have any generalized advice for using metaphors, but they're certainly interesting to think about. Yeah, I, I love that answer. And I think this idea of the difference between a flattening and a springboard metaphor, uh, and I'm just a little bit off the cuff here, it seems to me to be something about whether a metaphor carries sort of baggage that you didn't reflect adequately on, right? Like where that language is, is laden with certain things versus maybe a surprise intuition that you wouldn't have made without the metaphor. Maybe that's the difference between like flattening and springboarding, right? And so if you gather a metaphor that that isn't isn't like too, too conventional or too, um, yeah, embedded in a, like your own sort of cultural milieu, then, then maybe that's the moment at which it like, it actually offers you something remarkable. Um, I, I like that. I, I'll try to um, gather that <laughs> the next time I have to talk to my students about metaphor. <laughs> I think that's really, really well put. I like that a lot. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions. Uh, we, we're technically, this is the time I said we would be done, but it oh, looks like we got at least one more. Dennis Hector asks, you know, how does your lab relate the domains of felts and knits in their overlap in form and metaphoric content potentials? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, the idea of a knit, a knit is a looped fabric that uh, loops back in on itself and it stretches and often you have very little control over what it's going to do which is also a pleasure of working with that material and it can behave very well under tension right if you pull the loops one direction you get one kind of stretch factor you pull in another direction you get something else entirely and uh, so that material does its thing. Felting, however, works really well in compression and it's about kind of fibers that are intertwined and in mesh and that are pushed together because of compression, right? You sort of float them in the water, then you drain the water out of it and then you push down on all these loose fibers and they make a mat. That's one way of, one classic way of making a felt. There are other ways such as um, pounding bark, right? You can also push fibers apart uh, by pounding it apart. Um, but I don't, I don't know if these two fabrics overlap in content simply, at least I, I guess you could think about it any way that you choose, right? Um, I like to be really precise with the materials and think about how the processes that they come from. Uh, so felts to me are really all about this idea of compression. They work really well in compression. Uh, they also are highly fire resistant, typically compared to some other fabrics which have, which have more air in them. So in terms of metaphoric uh, content and potentials, you know, felt we might think of something as um, bearing the kind of weight and kind of, you know, really this idea of compression and pushing inward and, and this idea of knit as something else that's always going to hold together through the singular loop. So there are lots of possibilities through thinking about how things get made, fabrication processes in terms of um, enriching design, right? Great. I'm going to take one more from the from the chat because we got one more from Max Maxwell Giraz. Um, so working with textiles often has an association with touch and feel, usually mm -hmm. as a final product. For instance, the way textiles feel and expand on the body, or the way we experience movement through interacting with dynamic textile installations, the like. But it seems that your work flips this and focuses more on touch and feel in the fabrication process, 
while leaving the final product, in particular the last one, out of touch and denying the user the experience of feeling and interacting with the textiles. Can you talk about that, perhaps in relationship to your thinking on textiles and communication? Yeah, um, the last project uh, was in MoMA. So this is one of the limitations of MoMA. They don't like people touching things. <laughs> we were told, no, nobody will touch your sculpture. That's it. Because I started out wanting a touch sculpture. And that was also the point of the quilt to have it be touched, right? You touch the copper panel, but they were like, no, nobody's touching anything. <laughs> And so the quilt ended up being outside the gallery and the antenna was inside the gallery, but you couldn't touch it. So to your point, uh, there are other projects that I have made that are meant to be touched. This is, um, if you look up, uh, you can see a project, it's called Felt, F-E-L-T. I called it Feeling Emotion Linked Through Touch. And this is about the whole question that you're raising in your question, which is what about touch and architecture? And so I was looking at um, reading emotions that people take away through feeling different textures, different textures under kind of motion and trying to understand um, that as a potential for working in architecture. Because usually, uh, you know, I was reading Juhani Palazma and uh, Rasmussen and going, yeah, we should be doing this. Nobody's talking about touching anything in architecture, but it's there. We do it all the time, right? Um, it's our way of, as you say, being in touch. And I was like, huh, how come we don't really talk about this? So that project takes that head on. But again, this is, this is something MoMA has to work on. This is one of those framing, initial framing questions that I was worried about when I, we were first approached about this commission. You know, do we trust MoMA to show the work in a way that allows it to present architecture in an expansive mode, right? I was dealing with touch. I had tons of other stuff that, and they were like, no, nobody's touching anything. So, so I think that was a result of, of MoMA, right? Uh, in this particular case. And, um, but I, I think that touch is hugely important and it's something that we need to do more of in architecture um, as students of architecture needs to be explored as well. And there are other senses as well. We could talk about sound, right? We could talk about, not a lot of people uh, talk about taste in architecture, uh, <laughs> but, or smell, right? I have a colleague that works with smell in space, which is really amazing. Uh, and of course, there are other senses in our brain. We, we talk about these five senses, but there aren't five. There are a mix of things that happen in the body. And um, they are reprogrammed in our brain, depending on the experiences that we have. We can train our brain to have like smell sight or like you can do that. This has been, this is like new science, right? And so um, that is hugely interesting to me. So I don't know if I, I answered Maxwell's question, but it, yeah, it's a great, a great question. I think touch is fundamental to being in architecture. Yeah, I, I think that was, a, that was a great answer. It's curious to me, you know, MoMA, Speaking of like addressing different constituencies, probably this like don't touch rule comes from uh, a, a version of art which is about collectorship, right? right? So that they're addressing collectors who wouldn't want whatever it is that being exhibited touched as opposed to, uh, you know, thinking about art in the more expansive way that you've described it, which is about communication and, and interaction, right? And so there's something again tied into, I, I see why you guys would have been skeptical. I'm so super glad, of course, that you still did it. It was great, it was great work throughout for, for all of you. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's probably related to that. Um, we've yeah, kept I, you over, over time, but if you, I would love to hear a last word on it. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say something about, um, we had a discussion about archive and the kind of preciousness of the archive, uh, the whole idea of the way that archive gets framed um, with, you know, you go in, you wear your white gloves, you can touch the pages um, because they're meant to last through time. But we were talking about 
having things potentially go out of the archive into everyday life so that you could experience them through the practices that you went through. And, and so this was a discussion that we had, um, I think it was called Everyday Practices uh, at the Black in Design uh, at GSD. So taking on the whole problem of the idea of the museum and the archive, don't touch, right? Uh, as a cultural thing as well and living with, living with things, right? So um, anyway, I just wanted to add that in because I think Maxwell's question is really great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Felicia. Um, like I said, we've kept you over time, so we will let, let you go at this point. But, but you know, I wish you were in town, if nothing else, so that we could continue the conversation off at dinner somewhere. So we will try to get you back down here sometime soon. Um, it, was, it was truly an excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure being here. And, and thank you so much for the invitation and the great questions. Thanks. Thanks. So hope to see you soon. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Take care.